Is everybody mentally already on call break? Um, not really. Not really? Okay. Oh, yeah. All right, then I'm gonna look at you all lecture. Yeah. Oh, I think it's <laughs> okay. Like, so like, oh, okay. So there's a momentum. So, uh, there's there's some like academic anxiety. There's sort of an inertia. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we're gonna get a little bit deeper. Every single lecture, we're gonna go more and more and more into mTOR, which means if you haven't had me in some mTORian capacity before, it's gonna sound more and more foreign. Um, like you're meeting your foreign language, you know, criterion for, for your degree. And just try to keep up with the vocab. If there are vocabulary words, names of enzymes, uh, physiological functions, something like that, that don't ring familiar, just write those ones down and revisit them or ask about them or uh, go through the lecture and, and have a context or an application with those things. So we're going to get a little bit more into PKB and mTOR and the signaling and stuff that's going to activate it. We'll end with uh, the immune system and other chemicals, cytokines, these little proteins, these chemicals that will trigger mTOR or inhibit mTOR, that will modulate mTOR activity. Uh, Everything's up here, except for the review slides. Once the review slides are complete for this section one, I'll put them up at the end here. But right now, there's a link that you can see in Canvas for those review slides. Now, remember, there's going to be a case study coming soon. It's not going to be this, but this idea of take something that is flimsy and make it burly. Take something that is skinny and make it thick. You know, take a muscle that's all sinewy and, and you know, light on a scale and add strength, add bulk to it. And so an example, it's not gonna be this, but here's an example of what it could be. The BFG is tired of being tossed around by bone cruncher, flesh lump beater, blood bottler, child chewer, meat dripper, gizzard gulper, maid masher, man hugger, and the butcher boy. If you haven't read Girl Doll, those are the names of the other guys. Uh, he has impressive VO2 max, he runs a lot, but rickety sinews. Traditionally, he eats only snozcumbers. He's willing to do any diet, any supplement, any exercise, and change any behavior to outmighty the other giants. So something like this, but I'll make it a little bit more realistic. Just like we had Oprah for our weight loss one, a real person. Uh, I'll probably do a real person for the weight gain, but it would be the same thing as this. If you could answer this one, you could answer that one. And always start with this. Always start with this and then move on to this in, in this particular scenario. So just remember that we have here's PKB or AKT and the mTOR cascade. When we're looking at these different ways of developing musculature, of repair and remodeling, recuperative um, power between workouts, mTOR, if you have mTOR and also MAPK, uh, calcineurin, stuff like that, there's a little bit of of evidence for that, less evidence than there is for, for uh, and less effect than there is for mTOR. And MAPK is really important as well. Uh, you know what satellite cells are, what they do, and where they live. All right, here's where they live. And what they are is the muscle's stem cells. And they'll donate their nuclei. You can fuse new, um, you can make new fibers out of it, but uh, there are proteins and, and nuclei. They can donate to the cause. Uh, they express these myogenic regulatory factors. But the way we're going to activate those things to go from quiescent, silent, dormant, napping, lazy, you know, inactive, to go from that state, to go from quarantine to physical activity to, to participation, mTOR signaling is critical. mTOR signaling is critical for those satellite cells to get to work. So mTOR is necessary for satellite cell proliferation and differentiation. Deletion of mTOR leads to reduced expression of key myogenic genes. Um, so mTOR is necessary for that stuff. Now remember, there's different types of hypertrophy. Uh, there's the more functional stuff. Let's get contractile proteins deposited, actin, myosin, the cross-bridge cycling, the filaments that slide and sliding filaments uh, theory. Uh, get those things deposited, but there's tons of protein in here, tons of protein that you can deposit. So, um, you know, within a sarcolemma, 
that the hypertrophy can be functional or non-functional. It can be bulk or it can be functional. And specificity of adaptation, it depends on the loads applied to the tissue, how you're going to best respond to that. Um, now, cell signaling, remember, you have a cell surface receptor. And what you're going to have with all three of these, autocrine signaling means self-signaling. You release a thing, and then that thing binds to itself and stimulates the signaling cascade. Paracrine, adjacent cells. Paracrine, let's release a thing and activate our neighbor. And then endocrine signaling is stuff like insulin and, and glucagon and leptin and testosterone. Most hormones that we think of are going to be endocrine signaling, meaning release into the blood, travel around in the blood for a while, and then bind to a cell surface receptor. Now, if you are a steroid hormone, go in and you have your receptor inside the cell. But for anything made out of protein, for anything, these amine hormones, cytokines, you know, polypeptide and protein hormones, um, thyroid aside, thyroid is a special exception, but for, for pretty much anything that's protein, it has to bind to a cell surface receptor and then initiate a signaling cascade within the cell and how questions on the exam, if I ask like, how does um, resistance training cause hypertrophy? It's different from a why question. Remember why questions of purpose? Why answers here, like why does resistance training cause hypertrophy? The why answer would be because the muscle is ill-equipped. It is unfit to endure this particular stress and it needs to be better and more resilient or, or have more, some component of muscular fitness needs to be changed so it can better tolerate bouts of that stress in the future. That would be a why question. And why is the sky blue? Who knows? That's not a question that has an answer. How is the sky blue then? Right? Blue waves are short and they scatter when they hit the particulates and that's so you see blue. Um, how questions are mechanisms. So how does resistance training cause hypertrophy? Mostly it's going to be mTOR. Mostly it's going to be cell signaling. Now I say mTOR not as a description of the enzyme itself, but as that cascade. Uh, you guys know like what a synecdoche is? Like we got to get some boots on the ground. If it's like a military thing. Nobody cares about boots. They care about soldiers. They use boots to characterize soldiers. Right, a synecdoche is, is some little fragment representing the whole. So when I talk about mTOR, I don't mean the mTOR kinase independent of everything else in the signaling cascade, and let's ignore everything else that ha that's happening inside itself. I mean this, this large I5 corridor from the cell surface to uh, protein translation, to genetic expression changes, to hypertrophy. And we know insulin signaling, what that looks like, but we've been talking about insulin signaling from phosphodiesterase inhibiting PKA signaling. And now the more we focus on PKB signaling, we know it does mTOR also. That PKB is going to initiate mTOR signaling. And so PKB will inhibit tubrin. Tubrin is inhibiting REB. REB with GTP bound to it. We'll talk about that later. REB binds to mTOR, activating mTOR. mTOR is an enzyme that phosphorylates downstream targets. Those downstream targets are responsible for hypertrophy. So you have to initiate the cell signaling cascade somehow, and you can do it in a number of ways. There are a number of ways to interact. You could interact at the level of the um, receptor. Um, you could interact at different receptors. There's intracellular interactions that you can have. There's nutritional, there's behavioral, there's exercise. There's so many different things, so many different um, verbs and nouns that you can incorporate into your life that will change mTOR signaling. So you can grow and get stronger and, you know, run faster, jump higher, lift more weights, have, you know, bulkier tissues, tighter sleeves or whatever. Um, males and females tend to have different goals in these things. So, uh, usually, not 100% of the time, but a majority, however slim that majority is, if you ask somebody what their physical goal is, commonly, 
females will report weight loss and males will report weight gain or some sort of like muscular adaptation. Commonly, not always. Um, there's a lot of females who are trying to get bigger and stronger for athleticism, um, some or for bodybuilding, um, whatever the reason. And so this applies to everybody. It's a little bit different in terms of um, biology. Of you know, males have way more testosterone, but at rest, females tend to have higher growth hormones, and growth hormone causes IGF to be released from the liver. And IGF does this chemical PI3K PKB signaling. So. Uh, males, females, this applies to everyone as long as it's a guy thing. Um, but, but PKB down to protein synthesis, and it does get more complicated. There are more players here. Uh, now we know PKB is inhibiting proxo, which is initiating um, ubiquitin proteasome system, lysosomal degradation. We're inhibiting cellular, you know, apoptosis and protein degradation. So we're inhibiting that. And then um, this is a, let's shut off the thing on this turning on the thing. Um, glycogen synthase kinase, that is a point of interaction of many things. That's a point of interaction for the Wnt protein, WNT, Wnt proteins. Uh, this is a point of interaction of things. So PKB is shutting off glycogen synthase kinase, and that would be turning on tuberin. And so we shut that off and we shut off tuberin. Let's do everything we can to inhibit tuberin because tuberin is inhibiting the mTOR complex. Remember, it's a complex. There are a lot of proteins involved. And downstream from that complex, we see 4-EBP1 and P70, S6K, S6K1, whatever you want to call it. Um, this thing is inhibiting translation. This thing's promoting translation. And so mTOR, the kinase, Raptor will recruit these so that mTOR, the kinase, can phosphorylate them. It looks like Dector is doing it because of how, where the arrows are. Um, Dector is actually inhibiting that. A uh, Dector is inhibiting the kinase activity of mTOR. Um, so Dector, Press 40, um, those two are negative regulators of mTOR. Uh, Dector also is activated PKB. We'll talk about that. Dector is interesting. Press 40 is not really particularly interesting, at least the state of evidence about Press 40. Uh, is not particularly interesting. Dector is a fascinating one, though. So hypertrophy, growth, it's just genetic expression differences, changes in what your genes are doing. At some point in the semester, we will talk about uh, how translation works, what translation is and how it works, um, how RNA gets read and, and consequences of what that looks like. We'll do a couple of lectures about the genome and its expression. But for now, all you need to know, um, transcription, that's in the nucleus. Transcription is in the nucleus. Translation is not. Translation is at the ribosome. The ribosome is where you make those proteins. You can think of it as the kitchen. The ribosome is the kitchen. And this, this uh, RNA is going to go to the ribosome like a recipe and say, here, cook up this. Right, chicken cacciatore ASAP, make this for me, whatever it is. Uh, that is translation, is you take ingredients, which are amino acids, you take ingredients and you link those ingredients together in a particular sequence. And then it folds up and you have yourself a little protein. So that's at the ribosome, which is not part of the nucleus. And that's translation. Translation is hypertrophy. Hypertrophy, growth, Protein translation, right? You're creating proteins. Which proteins you create uh, depends on the stress of supply. Um, now, remember the big picture stuff. It feels detailed. It feels like a little tiny picture, but this truly is the big picture for how deep we're going to go, for how detailed we're going to go. Um, BLC2 associated agonist of cell death, bad, right? BLC2, whatever, death, agonist of death. Um, Foxo, the forehead, Boxo, uh, the caspase enzymes, um, cysteine, aspartic, protease, there's a ton of these things. This is, we're degrading stuff. This is apoptosis. This is, this is protein degradation. That's what that is. And you notice that PKB is stopping all of it. Um, stopping glycogen synthase kinase three. Now that would be turning on tuberin. That would be shutting off glycogen synthase. So we got to shut this thing off. Uh, MDM2, that is 
Uh, you remember when we were talking about the uh, proteasome and the ubiquitin proteasome system and E3, the ligase, the enzyme, there's 600 or 800, there's a ton of different uh, versions of that E3 enzyme, which does ubiquitination, which, which attaches those ubiquitin proteins to the protein. Um, this is one of them, right? That is, that is one of them. And for P53, it doesn't matter. For, for an end, for a protein that is a tumor suppressor, a growth suppressor, you know, guardian of the genome or defender of the genome, it, people call this little protein um, a number of positive things. Um, and this uh, is degrading it, right? This is degrading it. And so PKD is shutting that, turning it off. Um, P27, same thing, proliferation, and this is shutting it off. This is a, uh, another sort of tumor suppressor, cancer suppressor. Uh, PKB shuts it off. So over here and up here, I mean, these things, this is like mTOR is horrible for cancer, unless you're cancer. If, if you're like reborn as cancer, um, mTOR is your enemy. But for humans, you're a human being, we're trying to fight cancer. Oh, PKB is just getting rid of the refs. Uh, for cancer. Um, Pras-40 negative regulator. Um, tubrin negative, a super negative regulator. Uh, endothelial nitric oxide synthase. You know what that is. Let's, let's generate some new, let's do some angio um, new, some new roadway, some genesis. Um, and then the AKT substrate, 160 kilodons. That's just, let's get sugar into the cell, right? That's GLUT4 translocation. So these, this is the big picture stuff of what PKB is doing. It has a lot of roles. PKB is busy. It phosphorylates tons of stuff, and that stuff is anabolic. PKB is just super, super anabolic. Now, remember, there are two mTOR complexes, complex one, complex two. The major difference, the major, well, I guess the major difference is the downstream targets. And the most important thing is the downstream targets are different. Um, mTOR is phosphorylating different things. But Raptor and Richter, uh, regulatory associated protein of TOR, a target of rapamycin, Raptor, Richter, rapamycin insensitive companion of TOR. So Richter and Raptor. Um, if you introduce rapamycin, it will halt the assembly of complex two, but it won't halt the Q function. It will, it will uh, complex one is just shut down in the, in the presence of rapamycin, goodbye complex one. Complex two takes time, that, that takes some time. Um, and then other stuff you're like, you know, Raptor's recruiting the downstream targets, but you look at these, Proter and, and Emson one or Ensign one, um, that's recruiting downstream target two, SGK. Uh, which is a bunch of ion stuff is, is what that one is doing. But we'll talk about this one later, this one. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later today. And the interaction between complexes one and two, downstream from complex two, PKB. That's one of its targets. PKB and PKC um, and SGK. But PKB, since that's downstream from complex one, PKB is upstream from complex, downstream from complex two, it's upstream from complex one. So if you activate complex two, the consequence is activation of complex one. Um, the narrative summary, right? We went over this last lecture. It's the same thing. I just made the font smaller so it fit on the slide. Uh, but that narrative summary of how this works, of how mTOR gets activated, beginning with PI3K. Tons of stuff goes through PI3K, not everything. Not everything stimulates mTOR through PI3K, but most stuff, most activation of mTOR is going to go through PI3K. And so this is the narrative summary of the most common road of hypertrophy, the most common path your cells take to grow, your muscle cells will take to grow. Now, complex two and complex one, the green over here, that's complex one, um, mRNA translation. Remember, let's go to the ribosome and we'll cook up some protein. So you know this signaling cascade, P70, SSK, 4 E, DP1. Um, protein turnover, um, what we're doing is halting all of these things, right? mTOR is halting all of these proteasome assembly. You know what the proteasome does. 
um, lysosome biogenesis, autophagy, autophagy, self eating. Uh, mTOR complex one is halting all of that degradation, all that atrophy and wasting and apoptosis, uh, all of that stuff. mTOR is, is halting. And over here, we're turning on translation. So turn off degradation, turn on translation. Um, complex two, ion transport, it does stop apoptosis and program cell death. Um, cell migration, cytoskeleton, uh, uh, rearrangement or, or you know, assembly. Uh, so complex two has a lot of functions, broad functions, and we're not really going to talk about them other than complex two's role in activating complex one. Complex one is really what we're talking about, which is one function. Of, of complex two is to activate complex one. So that stuff also happens. Uh, so here's getting back to this M sin one or M sin one um, can be phosphorylated by AKT or PKB. Remember, this is a recruiter. Um, this is a, a protein in complex two that helps recruit SGK, the ion transport. That can also be phosphorylated by PKB. It does. Complex two, um, one of its downstream targets. So there's um, PKB is PKB or AKT is one of its downstream targets, and then also PKC um, and SGK. So those are the three. Um, these, these targets that are going to carry out the bulk of its functions. And there's tons of stuff, you know, there's oh, digestion, there's, there's uh, vasoconstriction, um, you know, in the eyes, there's real stuff. There's tons of functions with complex two. Really broad survival functions. So if it does actually, that's the complex two. Okay, so complex two, does activate PKB, PKB activates complex one. So if complex two is running and phosphorylating PKB, you are going to get some complex one activity. Not that much though. If you're gonna rely on complex two to be the only stimulator of complex one, you will be the puniest creature who has ever lived. Does that make sense? There's a, there is some activation of complex one owing to complex two activity, um, but not that much. If you want to grow, you need much. You need to have muches and muches, right, of, of activation. And you're going to get most of that through PI3K, independent of complex two. Uh, but there is a reciprocal relationship between complex one and complex two. Um, PKB can phosphorylate that m one, that recruiter of, of SGK. And so you can get a promotion of complex two through complex one. It's not as direct. It's a domino promotion. But when you look at some of these graphs, you see AKT, that's PKB, right? PKB, AKT, exact same thing. Um, is turning on complex two. Yeah, that's a domino effect through uh, what appears to be a, a phosphorylation of that um, recruiter protein, um, m one of, of SGK. So there's, there's a little bit of, of help in activating complex two from complex one, but really complex two is the activator of complex one. Um, complex one would be taking more credit than it deserves if it claims, yeah, I turn on complex two. Uh, that would be a little bit bold of a statement of complex one. Complex two gets to make that statement about complex one though. Does that make sense? So there's this sort of a, a domino effect of how complex one, does that, you know, not technically M towards L, but PKB upstream from complex one can help uh, complex two get activated, which then will activate PKB and turn on complex one. Uh, but we're going to come back to a lot of these things, and you'll, by the end, everything on here um, will make perfect sense. You know, we talked about P53 a couple of times today, even 
We'll talk about LKB1. I've mentioned it, liver kinase B1, but don't think of it as a liver enzyme. It's ubiquitous. Um, turns on AMPK. I've mentioned AMPK several times. We're going to come back to it in detail. Um, you know, tuberin, the tuberous complex that can balance tuberin. There's RAG, there's mTOR. Um, we're going to talk about the RAGs. Um, this is if you're eating protein, if you're eating, if you have an amino acid supply, you can translocate mTOR. This is the lysosome, right? We've talked about the lysosome. Uh, for protein degradation a little bit. Um, we talked about the lysosome, but if mTOR has to be at the site of the lysosome for it to do its translation. Um, and so that's RAGs, that's what the RAGs are doing. That's why you have to eat protein. You, you can't get mTOR to turn on if you don't have any protein. Uh, if you're on a protein, if you have like, you know, quashia core or some protein deficiency disease, uh, you're not getting this. mTOR is not going to the, to the work site. Um, to do its translation. So there's actually two stimuli that need to simultaneously happen. And we'll talk about that in a couple of days, next week at some point. We'll, we'll talk about that, um, of the nutrition and the growth factors simultaneously to turn it on. Now, remember PKB, super busy. AKT or PKB, that one, super busy, does tons of things. But on this diagram, this is really all you need to pay attention to. We have complex two, activating AKT or PKB. We have PKB inhibiting tuberin, which is inhibiting REB, and REB would be binding, REB with a GTP, would be binding to the mTOR um, complex to turn it on. So this is all you really need right now. Um, and going back to this idea of what's the difference between complex two and complex one, now yeah, you know the basics, the, the really fundamental stuff. If you're just gonna break it down to the basic, basic core proteins for complex one, the mTOR enzyme, obviously. That's like, you know, the mother and father of signal. Uh, and then Raptor, that's gonna recruit your downstream targets. And then this is sort of pointless one. It's not pointless, but this the least important of them uh, is MLST8 or Gable G beta L, Gable, or MLST8. It's, it's all of these things have like tons of things. Um, and yeah, MLST8 is more common. I would say that one's more common than, than Gable. Even mTOR has, has a normal one. Um, complex two, again, the mTOR enzyme. Richter, instead of Raptor, still has MLST8, which is more important than complex two. MLST8 actually like, does stuff. In complex two, barely. Um, and then that one to recruit um, SGKs. This is one of the recruiters of SGKs, bigger player in this game. So if you think about, let's put it in baseball vernacular, it's sort of an analogy of, of how baseball works. If you want to have the game work at all, if you want to just be like a home run derby or something, or if you want, in this case, you want your defense to have any chance of anything. Well, you need a pitcher, you need a catcher, and you need some sort of fielder. I don't know, call a second base or out center field or something. You need something. Um, I, can use a few. I think this is softball, actually. So you have a softball team. And catcher, pitcher, outfielder, or whatever. You use like, those three positions, otherwise it's like you can't play at all. And so that would be mTOR, Raptor, and LSTA. The pitcher, that's mTOR. I mean, literally, it's about four lane stuff. Um, I guess the catcher is sort of calling the shots. That would be Raptor, recruiting the downstream target, stuff like that. That's the least important of those three. I would. The analogy starts to break down if you, if you try to make too much sense of it. Um, but then you add in the rest of the players. If you want the team to actually compete, if you want, if you want your team to work, to have a chance at winning, have a chance at uh, phosphor, at, at protein translation, you need to populate that. And so that's what all this stuff is. And this isn't everything, but these are all the key players. And we put a batter there too. So these are all the key players. Um, and we'll go one at a time through all of them. And then we'll talk about how uh, chemicals, immune system chemicals can activate mTOR. And then next week we'll get into all the other activators uh, of mTOR. But um, you need referees, right? There's, there's an umpire here to suggest there's more to it than this. There are so many referees because 
If mTOR gets out of control, you die. If you lose activity of mTOR, you die. So what you can do is lean mTOR signaling in a direction, right? You can lean, you can slant mTOR in the direction of off, right? In the, in the direction of inhibition and find yourself in atrophy mode. If you shut off mTOR, that's it for you. Um, permanently, like if, you, if you shut this off, if you just turn it on and leave it on, it's not merely running up the electric bill, right? You anabolize yourself to death. So you can't just permanently turn on, permanently turn off. What you can do is kind of promote to a degree, inhibit to a degree in favor of whatever direction you want. If you have cancer or if you want to be kind of big and strong, these are two different goals. And mTOR is the, I don't know, the linchpin or the, the hinge, right? The cardinal, the word hinge, whatever. So sort of like the cardinal signaling cascade. Uh, but there are so many referees because uh, if this gets out of control, that's death and you don't want to die. Um, or at least your body just has no interest in allowing you to do that. So this is a look at the complex. Remember, there's a bunch of proteins in here. It's a protein complex. mTOR itself is that one. Now, remember all of these names? Um, David Sabatini had RAFT1 was his. Um, Stuart Schreiber had FRAP, F-R-A-P. Um, Robert Abraham, or Abrahams, I think it's Abraham, um, was the one who came up with mTOR. But all of these, it's all about rapamycin and FKBP12. Right, mTOR, the mainly target of rapamycin, this chemical, from rapanumi, right, from Easter Island. This chemical, an exogenous chemical. Your body doesn't make it. Um, and the interaction with FKBP12. So when, when you come up with, when you look at um, FRAT and RAFT1, R-A-F-T, FKBP12. Uh, FRAT, FKBP12, that's what the F is. Um, so this is critical to the name which is anytime you discover these things, it's usually through some inhibition. You inhibit something like, whoa, look what isn't happening anymore. I introduced a chemical and then this whole like, metabolic thing doesn't happen anymore. Let's figure that out. Inhibition is a wonderful way to identify uh, biochemical pathways. And for the complex, that's FKBB12, rapamycin. This is the discovery of mTOR and why we have uh, this critical among the most important components of metabolism. I mean, we can talk about glycolysis all you want. mTOR is more important. You know, if we're going to talk what is metabolism, let's start with mTOR and then we'll you know, branch out into stuff like glycolysis, beta oxidation and stuff. Oh, I'll start here. I mean, this is the fundamental like platform upon which all metabolism is, is erected. And remember this idea of what metabolism, well, we have a balance of anabolism and catabolism and build up and break down. Where does that, where's that hinged? Right there. Everything else is just detailed. So we're talking about glycolysis and stuff. That's peripheral. This is central to not just human, but metabolism, but just the metabolism of life. Um, so that's mTOR. Now, Raptor, this one over here, over there, um, Raptor, that regulatory associated protein of TOR, recruits the downstream targets. Okay, so it's going to allow the mTOR kinase to phosphorylate them. Without Raptor, mTOR is sort of useless. Think of Raptor like a headhunter. It's going to go recruit so that mTOR can do its business. Um, without Raptor, you're not going to get that. This is actually like the Velociraptor. It's actually that like little chicken. And in real life, and, and like, you know, um, archaeological life, I guess. Uh, but there are multiple phosphorylation sites on Raptor. It's not like, well, it's phosphorylated, so it's on. It's phosphorylated, so it's on. You can turn on by phosphorylation. You can turn off by phosphorylation. There are lots of phosphorylation sites on Raptor. Raptor is a site for crosstalk. Raptor is a site where other 
molecules and other signaling cascades communicate with mTOR? Is it Raptor? <clears throat> REB, Ross homolog and Rishton and brain REB, um, promotes phosphorylation as well of, of Raptor. You need Raptor phosphorylation in a positive way for mTOR to do anything, for mTOR to be of any use at all. Raptor has to be phosphorylated. Um, now, AMPK, we've talked about a little bit. AMPK, from the idea that AMPK is going to promote you know, mitochondrial biogenesis, AMPK is going to promote GLUT4 translocation. AMPK is going to turn on glycolysis um, through hexokinase and, and phosphofructokinase. Uh, AMPK is going to turn on uh, FOXO and ULP1 protein degradation. We've talked about all these things, but AMPK also phosphorylates Raptor and shuts it off. So AMPK, if that is active, Raptor is inactive. Raptor is not recruiting mTOR's targets if AMPK is having its way with Raptor at the time. Now, MAPK, not AMPK, but MAPK, just swap the A and the M. And this is highly promotional of Raptor. So AMPK inhibits Raptor. MAPK promotes Raptor. They both phosphorylate it, but they phosphorylate it at different sites. AMPK inhibits, MAPK promotes. Um, now, RSK, this is the whole signaling cascade, just in that same synecdoche -y way that I talk about mTOR as not the enzyme itself, but a representative of a cascade. Um, MAPK is representative of a, of a cascade. When you look at RSK within that cascade, um, here's an MAPK pathway. There's RSK, and we see Raptor phosphorylation in a positive way. Um, we see tuberin inhibition. So it's phosphor, RSK is phosphorylating a lot of stuff too. And this MAPK, mitogen activated protein kinase, MAPK, uh, RSK, sort of at this terminal end of it, is doing a ton of phosphorylation. Now, um, RSK does more than that. We don't quite know the, the full extent. These articles will be available later today um, on the site. But what RSK is doing, um, there's, there's a lot of evidence of a broader anabolic effect of, of RSK. So there's LKB1. LKB1 is the direct activator of AMPK. AMP just permits LKB1 to activate. You have to bind AMP to AMPK. And once you do that, bind a couple of them to it, now LKB1 can activate AMPK. And you know what AMPK does? Inhibits mTOR, among other things. Um, through Raptor too, we, Raptor is a dog here. Um, but AMPK would be inhibiting mTOR through both tuberin and Raptor. Yeah, here somewhere. Um, RSK, GSK, right? Um, so GSK would be turning on tuberin. All right, let's stop that as well. And then the downstream targets uh, of mTOR. So there's a lot of activity, a broader activity of MAPK, mitogen-activated protein kinase, and RSK within that signaling cascade. So Raptor, the summary of Raptor, um, recruits mTOR, mTOR the, N the kinase, the enzyme that phosphorylates stuff. What's it gonna phosphorylate? We'll have a Raptor deliver those targets, have a Raptor recruit those targets. Um, there are multiple phosphorylation sites on Raptor. You can inhibit or um, activate Raptor via phosphorylation. So you, you, depending on where you phosphorylate it, you're turning it on or turning it off. And you need to turn it on for mTOR to actually work. Red promotes phosphorylation. Um, the MAPK, RSK, that's going to phosphorylate Raptor in a positive way. Um, AMPK is going to phosphorylate it in a negative way. Okay, um, MLST8. Who has seen Interview with the Vampire? One, two, three, obviously JP has. <laughs> There's no cinematic history that I can that I can slip past JP. Okay, we're gonna watch just a quick scene of interview with the vampire. Ah! 
If that's what's that? Singers. I had a mother one. We don't need to watch all the movies. So, um, Interviews of Vampire. It's tons of huge actors for the time. But Kirsten Dunst, obviously, and Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, Antonio Banderas, also the Christian Slater. All the big names of the time uh, were in that. But Lestat is the guy's name. So if you're going to do MLSTH, if you're going to do Lestat as a license plate, Right, just put a little M in front of it, and now you remember M Lestat, right? M L S T H. Um, and this one, it is a core protein, M L S T A, M L S T A, in both complex one and complex two, M L S T A or Gable. Now, what its functions are sort of depends. Um, complex two is a little bit more functional than complex one. Um, what gets reported, MLSD8 directly stabilizes the active site of, of mTOR, supporting the idea that it plays a critical role in, in mTOR kinase activity. Not really in complex one. It's not really doing that in complex one. Um, MLSD8 is required for formation of complex two. Yes. Yes, it is. Suggesting a specific role for complex two function as well. So MLSD8, the formation of complex two, that's really what it's for. Um, and uh, it's critical for the proper regulation of mTOR pathways, but its precise function still needs to be defined. So that was 2015, and its precise function isn't really all that much clearer today. Um, now, in cancer cells, uh, MLSD8 knockdown in cancer cells leads to a reduction in formation of complex one and to a uh, phosphorylation of eight, uh, PKB and 4EBP1, since the results previously. So in, in cancer cells, um, MLSD8 is a potential target. If somebody has cancer and you can knock out MLST8, that's a potential uh, therapeutic agent for cancer cells. Cancer cells seem to behave a little bit differently um, from, from non cancer cells. Um, this one, um, you know, we assess MLST8 loss in a panel of normal and cancer cells, observed a little to no impact on assembly or activity of complex one. So MLST8, mTOR complex one, Nothing really going on, but um, MLSD8 loss blocked mTOR association with complex two, um, especially the enzyme one. Um, so together, these data suggest that the scaffolding function of MLSD8 is critical for assembly and activity of mTOR complex two, but doesn't really seem to do much in complex one. It just sort of loiters, sort of loiters in complex one. In the presentation of cancer, there may be a different narrative of MLSDH function and as a potential therapeutic intervention. Um, but really what it seems to be doing, um, it's a molecular bridge between mTOR and sin one and sin one that, that complex two recruiter of SGK. So in the assembly of complex two, this is the critical protein. But you can knock it out, you can just eliminate it completely and complex one just goes on as happily as ever. So the least important player in that, crit, in that core hub uh, of mTOR is going to be MLSD8. Um, this is just, this is from 2017. David Sabatini, probably the biggest researcher of, of, this, of this subject. Uh, MLSD8 by contrast associates with the catalytic domain of mTOR complex one and may stabilize the kinase active activation loop, though genetic studies suggest it is dispensable for the essential functions of mTOR complex one. You get rid of it, it doesn't, nothing really seems to happen. So ML, that's MLST8. So that's the core hub of mTOR. Getting into these immediately adjacent upstream and downstream uh, proteins, there's ANPK, right, activating tuberin. There's a PKB deactivating tuberin. So we know that. We know what tuberin is doing. Tuberin, so here's red. Red needs is GTP to bind to the mTOR complex. And so if you break down the GTP, which is what the tuberous sclerosis complex is doing. Red can't activate mTOR. So tuberin is an upstream inhibitor of mTOR. Um, red is the immediately upstream promoter. Red is going to bind and turn on mTOR, but is not allowed to bind as long as uh, tuberin is breaking down its GTP. 
you know, rapamycin, FKD12, we talked about that. Um, the immediate downstream targets, uh, P70, SSK, 4EBP1, this is the thing that's inhibiting translation, 4EBP1. Uh, P70, SSK is a thing that's indirectly, but, but somewhere almost directly promoting translation. That's ribosomal protein S6. Protein synthesis, remember, translation is a ribosomal phenomenon. It's not happening in the, in the nucleus, it's happening in the ribosome and ribosomal protein S6 right there. So that's this list of immediately adjacent players. They're, these are not in the core proteins. These aren't considered core proteins of mTOR complex one, but they are those other players on the field that are really necessary for that gene to function. Now it does get a little bit more complicated and you don't need to write any of this down, but just to be aware that some of these phosphorylation cascades do stretch uh, a little bit longer. Um, there's 4-EBP1, there's P70-SSK, there's ribosomal protein S6. Um, but when we look at some of these elongation factors, EF elongation factors, there's a little bit more at play. Don't write any of it down. Um, P70-SSK is named after this. This was discovered before him. Um, so this ribosomal protein S6, that's really the important one on that side. Everything's important. But, um, now, Dector and PRAS40, getting into these inhibitors, these negative regulators, inhibitors are negative regulators of, of mTOR. Um, PRAS40, PKB phosphorylates it, and so does mTOR. Um, mTOR phosphorylates it as well. Once you activate mTOR, mTOR itself phosphorylates that thing, and it withdraws its inhibition. It gives up the, the effort to, to withdraw or to, to um, suppress mTOR. Dector um, is phosphorylated by mTOR. If you activate mTOR, mTOR will phosphorylate Dector and that will withdraw Dector's effects. But Dector is really fascinating because the kinase activity of mTOR, meaning phosphorylating stuff, mTOR's ability to phosphorylate, Dector is inhibiting that. It's like a sibling rivalry. Um, Dector doesn't want mTOR to shine, so it's inhibiting that. Um, but mTOR activity is reducing the expression of Dector. So there's sort of a chronic effect here. Um, the more active mTOR is, the less Dector you have. And Dector is antagonizing mTOR's kinase activity. So Dector is a negative regulator in a quarreling sibling kind of way. They really oppose each other, these two. If mTOR phosphorylates Dector, Dector um, acutely withdraws its function. But just run mTOR sort of unopposed for a while, and you're getting less and less uh, Dector. But more interestingly, of Dector's role is you guys know what a morally gray character is in the literature? It's like, I'll get on the way in if I'm seeing pictures. Um, uh, I don't know, if you watch Game of Thrones, it's like Jamie Lannister or something. These characters that have um, a moral side, yeah, they're, they're both hero and villain all in one. Like these morally gray characters. Uh, who's familiar with like um, Lord of the Rings? Boromir, the only guy in the nine who's like both a good guy and a bad guy. Like tries to take the ring from Frodo, but he's like a good guy too. These sort of morally gray characters. Um, that's Dector, this morally gray character. It inhibits mTOR, but it also inhibits apoptosis. Remember, mTOR is inhibiting apoptosis. Dector is like, ah, mTOR, I'm not letting you do your thing. I want to take credit here. So mTOR gets shut off, but then Dector is also like, but I also don't want you know, a bunch of cell death. And so Dector shuts off apoptosis as well, activates PKB and your PKB signaling. Um, and caspase, remember we talked about caspase 9? earlier, just a bunch of these caspase enzymes. Uh, and it's protease, the caspase of protease. Cysteine, aspartic protease, whatever. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so pro caspase three in this case. So Dector has a fascinating role as an inhibitor of mTOR and an inhibitor of some of the stuff that mTOR was going to be inhibited. So it's an interesting, much more interesting one. You know, Dector and mTOR role work where um, Dector is inhibiting mTOR, but then also turning on PKB. But then PKB isn't turning on mTOR because Dector is inhibiting. 
But through PKB, you get this you know, proliferation, you get, you get this inhibition of autophagy. And so Decker is fascinating. It's not, it's not like an outright anabolic, but it's anti-catabolic while being anti-anabolic. Step is weird. Um, that's all that's saying. And this is just when mTOR is activated, it's going to phosphorylate those things, press 40 and And that's going to withdraw their inhibition, allowing mTOR to do its kinase activity, its phosphorylating, to phosphorylate its downstream targets, provided Raptor um, has provided them. Okay, so what we're going to cover in the next couple of, you know, today, we're just going to do the immune system and corresponding chemicals. Um, and then I hope to get through all three of these on Monday. Uh, so the mechanical loads, the, the application of a load to the tissue and how the body receives loads and what happens uh, when that tension is acknowledged and then mechanotransduced, right? Mechanotransduction, the endocrine system, Overlapping with you know immune system and chemicals, you know what counts as a hormone? You know, it's a hormone is sort of a vague term, um, but the endocrine system will treat independently from sort of cytokines and stuff like that, from from hormone like actions. Uh, and then nutrition, nutrition may take a little bit longer as uh, that's this is where we get into. Um, the proteins, how proteins are recognized, which amino acids are, are you know, not all amino acids are equal. Um, some amino acids are more mTOR stimulating than others. But for today, just the immune system, chemicals, uh, if you take NSAIDs, first chemical we'll talk about is prostaglandins. NSAIDs, these non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, what you're blocking is cyclooxygens, COX, COX, they're COX blockers. So these cyclooxygenase inhibitors, what cyclooxygenase is doing, you, okay, in your phospholipid bilayer, right, one of the fats, not all of them, but one of these fats is arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is released from that phospholipid bilayer by PLA2, phospholipase A2. That's what releases it. Now, the thing that inhibits PLA2 is like get a cortisone injection. Cortisone injections are great pain relievers. Those block phospholipase A2. So you actually don't release arachidonic acid from your phospholipid bilayer, right? From this, from the phospholipid bilayer. Um, you don't actually release it. But unless you just had a cortisone injection, go work out, you release a bunch of arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid can have multiple fates. You got to do something with it. You're not going to keep your arachidonic acid. You're actually like, well, I have it now. I'm just going to store it uh, in a little lump. And I'll just have a growing lump of arachidonic acid. That's not how it works. You have to dispose of it. Uh, it has a terminal fate. And after exercise, that terminal fate is probably going to be prostaglandins from cyclooxygenase. Now, if you block it, if you take an NSAID, ibuprofen, something like this, if you take one of these, one of these, something will be available later today. Uh, you block COX. You have to do something else with your arachidonic acid, and so you convert to leukotrienes. Right, leukotrienes through light oxygenase and white blood cells. So uh, asthmatic, if you, if you take your Advil, that's how you grow, take your Advil and look at the warning label and it says like asthmatics beware. You know, if you suffer from COPD or asthma or whatever, do not take this. That's because you're upregulating. You have to do something with your arachidonic acid. And so if you're blocking its conversion to prostaglandins, you just put cones in that road and all that traffic gets detoured. Um, and if you wind up with a bunch of leukotrienes, that's asthmatic inflammation. Um, but what leukotrienes aren't doing, that prostaglandins are doing, is activating MAPK, mitogen activated protein kinase. And you see RSK there. So this MAPK signaling casket, this thing, this thing in green, ERK, extracellular signal regulated kinase, or 
So MAPK signaling here, and there's RSK, and we talked about all the stuff that RSK does. Phosphorylates a ton of anabolic things. So you work out, you bang up your membranes a little bit, you release arachidonic acid. If you take ibuprofen, you are abolishing your ability to recuperate from that workout. You are abolishing your ability, your body's ability to regenerate that tissue. You are impairing pretty drastically hypertrophy signals. Translation, I can say this in a thousand ways, right? Translation becomes a challenge. Atrophy sets in. I, I could go for the rest of, of the class just expressing that one sentence over and over in different words. Um, don't take NSAIDs is really what I'm saying. Unless they're necessary. They're necessary in, in certain situations. Um, arachidonic acid as a supplement seems to have some effect. There's, there's limited evidence. Uh, arachidonic acid as a supplement um, seems to have some uh, pro-anabolic uh, effect. I wouldn't take it, but, um, but that's the, the prostaglandin signaling. If you, if you knock out prostaglandins, you knock out prostaglandin signaling. Now, a lot of the pain you're going to experience, delayed onset muscle soreness, that's prostaglandins. Not exclusively, but prostaglandins are, are leading that. And you can, you can run the experiment, just take before exercise. Take a bunch of, of NSAIDs and then exercise, and then notice how sore you don't get. Prostaglandins are a lot of that uh, delayed onset muscle soreness. They're also a lot of the signal for hypertrophy. So why exercise at all if you're going to be taking NSAIDs? Um, this is just another look at the, at the same thing. This crosstalk uh, between, remember what I said, MAPK uh, is going to crosstalk similar to AMPK, right? MAPK, tuberin, and raptor. MAPK is anabolic at tuberin and raptor. Plus, it has its own you know, RSK. Let's block GSK. RSK has a ton of stuff. Uh, but there's crosstalk, pretty direct crosstalk between mTOR and MAPK at both tuberin and raptor. Shut off tuberin, turn on raptor. That's what MAPK is doing. So raptor is just this hub for tons of crosstalk, even the protein stuff. Leucine is a particular amino acid of particular importance. Leucine and arginine, those are going to be your two uh, most useful amino acids for, for hypertrophy. But NAPK, going through the PI3K, PKB stuff, going through leucine. Raptor is this hub of anabolism. It's a hub where stuff can interact and either shut off your response in the weight room or promote it. Because the goal, right, let's say you're a, I don't know, you're a, you track, or thing, you like soccer, you do soccer. Oh, you, you're going to need to do those sprints. You got to get fast. You, gotta those, you need some of those sprints. Then you have to manage that with a bunch of aerobic conditioning as well. Probably aerobic conditioning is more important. But um, no matter what the sport is, ask Lance Armstrong what he did for resistance training. Man, that guy did like heavy lunches and stuff. Because you got to hit the hills. You have to have your sprints too. And there isn't as much evidence that resistance training kills aerobic uh, capacity as there is that aerobic training kills anabolism. There's much more evidence, much more uh, physiological uh, decay of hypertrophy in the presence of aerobic stimulation than the other way around. But raptor is a, is a point where you can turn on or turn that stuff off. Now, getting into, getting beyond uh, prostaglandins and looking at myokines, stop the muscle releases. A myokine, a cytokine, a little signaling protein. A cytokine is a is a little protein. It's a little protein that a cell releases that has hormone-like actions. It influences stuff. It's gonna go bind somewhere and influence something else. So there's just cytokines. A myokine, myo just means muscle. Myokines. There are tons of these things. You know, there's some myocytopenia medium has revealed over 600 myokines. Okay, but we don't have any idea what most of these things do. Most of these things, no clue what these things are doing. Uh, 
human performance physiology, muscle physiology, relatively young fields, right? Physiology is an old field. Health, exercise, science, the, the bolstering of lifespan and cardiovascular health, super old fields, super old. Human performance, muscle physiology, hypertrophy, super young fields. I mean, getting to the 80s and the mTOR, what the hell are you talking, what is that? Right, growth is testosterone. I mean, that's like all anybody could say in the 80s because we didn't know anything. This stuff hadn't been discovered. Um, and so and to date, okay, there's like 600 of these things, they're all doing something. But nobody has any idea what most of them are doing. But here's some of the here's some of them. The green ones here. Um, these are either inhibiting atrophy, inhibiting degradation, or and or promoting uh, protein synthesis, promoting conversion. Now myostatin, I think most people have heard of myostatin. Those Belgian blue cows. You know, those cows that make, I don't know, the Ronnie Coleman's of the world who look prepubescent. If you haven't seen a Belgian blue cow, just Google it. I mean, they're just like absurd. Um, those are myostatin knockout cows. Through selective breeding, they get rid of myostatin. Now, myostatin has a lot of roles. One of those roles, one of those roles in a developed adult is PKB inhibition. The interleukins between leukocytes, um, although it was named at a conference kind of near interleukin, Switzerland, but interleukin between leukocytes. Um, so IL-6, you're seeing increased muscle atrophy, but IL-15, IL-2, IL-15, some of these interleukins, there's a bunch of interleukins, um, some of these are uh, promoting a hypertrophy. BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, we're going to talk a lot about that one um, when we get into the brain section, release with exercise, and uh, when we see like dendritic sprouting and, and the BDNF is, is critical for that. Um, now, how do these things work? How do these myokines, how do these, how do these little proteins do their signal? Most growth, you're going to see it's going through PKB. Go through PKB. Either you hit a PKB or you turn on PKB. Most of these chemicals are a PKB phenomenon. PKB mTOR. There's a MPK. Most, a lot of the stuff here. It's interleukins here. So let's let's waste away and let's grow. We'll talk about a few of these that have a ton of research. Um, but there's, you know, again, the, all of these, the signaling of these things. So there's BDNF uh, going to PKB, uh, myostatin inhibiting PKB. IL-15. This one has been known for a long time. Study after study after study after study. I don't think I put any of these up, but uh, interleukin-15 increases myosin accretion in human skeletal muscle. The response to resistance training, if you go hard enough, if you damage tissues, right? If you push yourself to do a bunch of, of tissue disruption is you're gonna release a bunch of IL-15 among other things. You'll release more prostaglandins, more IL-2, more, yeah, a lot of stuff gets released. More growth hormone, right? If you go for a while. <sighs> We'll talk about the hormones later, though, for the, the immune response, the cytokines. IL-15 is proportional to the amount of tissue damage you do. You release more and more and more. And the more of this you release, the more PI3K, PKB uh, signaling you get. Now, this is IL-2, and you see the PKB. Um, so there's PI3K converting PIT2 to PIT3. There's PKB. You know, downstream from PKB, APT, PKB pathway. All right, whatever. Uh, so IL2, IL15, interferon gamma interferes. That's the interferon comes from. It interferes with, with viral replication. Um, so hemokine, cytokine, etc. All these things point to PI3K. There's IL2, uh, there's interferon gamma pointing to PI3K. Same thing the insulin works through. Same thing the IGF works through. PI3K, phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase, 
over its pit two to pit three. That is this growth road that just has on ramps all over the place, on ramp after on ramp after on ramp onto that PI3K PKB mTOR highway of, of hypertrophy. Um, this one, you know, just endogenous interferon gamma is required for efficient skeletal muscle regeneration. Uh, we show that interferon gamma is expressed at both mRNA and protein levels in skeletal muscle following injury, and that the time course of interferon gamma expression correlates with the accumulation of macrophage, T cells, natural killer cells, as well as myoblasts in damaged muscle. Cells of each type were isolated from injured muscle. Interferon gamma expression was detected in each cell type. In summary, our results indicate that interferon gamma promotes muscle healing in part by stimulating formation of new muscle fibers. And how is interferon gamma working? A bunch of PI3K, PKB, and TOR signal. Um, here's myostatin. You know, myostatin was on previous diagram too, but myostatin and its inhibition of PKB. Myostatin has a ton of effects uh, of, of anti um, uh, hypertrophy and hyperplasia or anti growth effects. Um, Exercise induced injury, uh, but you'll you'll get the same thing in, in any sort of injury um, because anything where there's tissue disruption needs to be healed and matters of scale. You know, if it's if it's really injured, oh yeah, there's a lot more to do. You know, it's not merely sore for three days. It's like injured for six weeks or something, um, and so you're going to get the same cascade of healing, unless you're doing something like, you know, taking a bunch of NSAIDs, you know, um, the, then the cascade of healing, uh, if it's a large injury owing to like you sprain a thing or whatever, or it's like I did a bunch of squats, the, the phases, the steps of healing overlap greatly to the point where it's like the exact same, but only, you know, differences of the timing of it. Um, how long do you have neutrophils in there? You know, how long are the macrophages there? How long before the fibroblasts are there? How long is, you know, so, so the magnitude of the healing response and the time course of it is going to be different, but the sequence and the compounds, the proteins are the same. Um, this one is uh, tumor necrosis factor. TNF alpha is what is always called in older stuff. Now we used to be using TNF. Um, tumor necrosis factor, same thing. We're seeing a PI3K, PKB uh, signal um, with TNF. So you just write down TNF as another promoter. Um, the Wnt proteins, as you know, the Wnt, WNT proteins, frizzled, disheveled, GSK, glycogen synthase kinase. Um, and so through GSK, we are, um, through the inhibition of, of GSK, we are um, halting that relationship with tubrin. Um, we can help turn off tubrin, stop the thing that's turning, stop one of the things that's turning tubrin on. Now, reactive oxygen species are a little weird. Uh, in that first article on the day we're talking about like protein anabolism, before we started really talking about mTOR, reactive oxygen species were listed as a, as a signal for growth. And to 2013, so it is clear that at pathologically high chronic levels of reactive oxygen species um, are cytotoxic, right? free radicals, right? the stuff you take antioxidants to, to combat. However, it is also now clear that during contraction, Reactive oxygen species produced at low physiological levels may play an important role in cell signaling and normal, healthy skeletal muscle. You just study after study. These aren't Kleenexes, these are just studies. Right? Study after study after study, just read and read and read, and you'll get conflicting results on this. On the role of reactive oxygen species on, on cells. So you can come up with like 21. Like you said, that is really this is the one that's most revealing. It's a 2010 study, but multi mechanisms are involved in reactive oxygen species regulation of mTOR signaling. This will be up later today. Uh, in conclusion, this study provides evidence that reactive oxygen species uh, from extracellular or intracellular you know, sources 
uh, may either inhibit or activate mTOR complex one. Reactive oxygen species can go either way. They can promote or they can inhibit um, in vivo and in cells. Low doses of reactive oxygen species uh, stimulate mTOR. A low dose, a physiological dose, an exercise induced dose, something that's not pathological, something that's not introduced sort of chemically, um, something that's not an exaggerated response. A low dose, a normal physiological dose will stimulate mTOR. High concentrations or long term uh, reactive oxygen species uh, treatment decreases mTOR complex one activity. So, reactive oxygen species are a promoter at a physiological dose as, as part of your exercise. You can take reactive oxygen species scavenging compounds, just like you can take, uh, you can take, um, you know, a pH, you know, you can go take like sodium bicarbonate or something, a pH buffering compound, and you can manage the, your pH as a, as a performance enhancing agent. You can do the same thing with reactive oxygen species. There's compounds that'll scavenge those. And, and if you're a marathon runner, you can improve your performance. But I wouldn't do that if you're trying to, you know, get bigger. If you're trying to respond to your exercise optimally, what gets released with exercise? These sort of biomarkers of a good workout, while they may be uncomfortable, while they may cause a little bit of damage, um, are also the signal for adaptation. Right? That is what initiates. The response. So this is just our summary slide of, of all of the the chemical and immune compounds for which evidence is pretty sufficient. Remember, six hundred of these things, and who knows what the hell they're doing. But these ones, there's there's relatively good evidence of their role in mTOR signaling, their role in anabolism, and most of it works through PI3K. Just all of these cell surface receptors, not all, but a great many go through PI3K. And some are also going through MAPK as well. Okay, so if you haven't had mTOR before, I know that's a lot. That's a, that's a lot to take in. Try to take it in a couple of times between now and Monday. Uh, so you're so you're ready to go on Monday, and I'll do a little more reviewing of this stuff. You know, I'll spend the first 10, 15 minutes, something like that, rehashing what we talked about uh, before blasting into the new stuff. But the new stuff we're going to talk about: mechanical loads, endocrine system, so classic hormones, and glands. It's not all glands, as you know. There's any cell release that stuff, like IGF, for example, can come out of fat, and muscle, and, and liver, and like, like, but. Um, and then nutrition. And nutrition might take a little bit longer. I'm not sure how much detail we're going to cannonball into, but that's it for that's it for your long weekend. <laughs>